as I stood in my room tonight, as I stood in my room tonight, drinking a solitary toast to the greatest poet of all time, Hart Crane, I began to dance. For in the distance, I heard a radio playing. I was in Brooklyn, in view of the bridge. I could see it from my 17th story window. I saw you stride across it, Hart, great swinging stars with lanterns in both hands, a bellowing voice. Oh, you were the giant of Brooklyn. I saw you followed by companies of sailors. Whitman came after you too, spewing wine on his beard. Poe with his raven followed at some distance. Unholy trinity. But there was fellowship in you. You stood, Crane, on the bridge and shouted to Melville. I heard his hollow answer from the deep. So many swimmers sprang, so many fish, the air was cut by wings of phosphorescence. Beneath arcades, the hardy loiterers tossed silver coins, and I, I danced with them too on my 17th story. I was filled with the running warmth, the greatness of blood, which is you, dear brawling crane. This is from a play called Mr. Paradise. It's um, set in a squalid residence in New Orleans's French Quarter. Mr. Anthony Paradise? This is your book. Did you buy it? Yes. Then it belongs to you. No, a work of art is not a commodity, Mr. Paradise. It is never bought or sold. It always remains in the possession of the person who produced it. Why didn't you answer my letters, Mr. Paradise? I have not heard the sound of Gabriel's horn. What do you mean? <laughs> the time is not yet ripe for my resurrection. How did you happen to come across that little book? Mother and I were hunting antiques in the quarter. We went to a little shop on Bourbon Street. There was a little Chinese tea table with one leg slightly shorter than the others. The antique dealer had placed this volume under the short leg <laughs> to balance the table. Mother bought the table. <laughs> the chauffeur carried it out to the car. This little book was left there, lying on the floor. The antique dealer kicked it out of the way without looking at it. To me, there is always something a little pathetic about a discarded book. You see, I write a little myself, poems mostly. I know what it means to put your heart on paper. I stooped over to look at the book. The title had been rubbed off, the gilt lettering was gone, but I saw your name still on it, Anthony Paradise. It struck my fancy, so I picked it up. I turned through the pages. Why, this is a book of poems, I said to the dealer. Is it, he said. How did you get it, I asked him. Where did it come from? How long has it been lying here? Who is Anthony Paradise? The antique dealer laughed. God only knows, he said. I probably bought it up with a bunch of others a long, long time ago. Stuff like that don't sell. Sometimes I use it to light up a fire with. <laughs> I'd like to buy it, I said. How much do you want for this book? He spread his arms in a great, magnificent gesture and said, you can have it for nothing. <laughs> the 
the chauffeur came in to remind me that my mother was waiting in the car. So I hurried back out, slipping the little volume in my pocketbook. We rushed off to another cocktail party. I'm home from college for the holidays, and life is a round of those things. It was more than usually dull this afternoon. I don't believe in dullness. I believe in excitement and wonder and passion. I believe in people having a storm in their hearts, a great, big, furious storm that sweeps all trivialities away like scraps of ribbon or dead leaves. I went upstairs to look at the book, which I suddenly remembered when somebody asked me how I liked Bryn Mawr for the 20th time. <laughs> to my infinite wonder, I discovered what I had been looking for exactly a great, big, furious storm that swept those trivialities away like scraps of ribbon or dead leaves. What do you think of that? Are you referring to this book of verse? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Hmm. Young lady. This book was published 15, 20 years ago. Nobody remembers it. It's completely forgotten. I remember it. I sat up there in the powder room for heaven knows how long. I read it through once more and then again and again. It was like bells ringing inside me, great big, solemn cathedral bells that shook me through and through. I went around feverishly inquiring of bookstores and libraries and all kinds of writers I know about who was this Anthony Paradise. No luck, completely unknown. <laughs> then at last I wrote a letter to the publishing firm and in due time I received an answer saying that Mr. Anthony Paradise when last heard of, was living in the old French quarter of New Orleans. But that was 10 or 15 years ago, and it was feared that he might have disappeared altogether. Speaking of miracles, what do you think of that? <laughs> Here you were, right at the tips of my fingers, me in one part of town and you in the other, 15 minutes away. So. I wrote you the first of the letters. I got no answer. I wrote you two more letters, which you also ignored. Then I determined that I wouldn't be snubbed. I wouldn't let you refuse to be discovered. So, 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 here I am. Here I am, Mr. Paradise. And here you are. Here you are. <laughs> and here I am. Yes, indeed. What are you intending to do about it? Oh, don't you know? Can't you guess? Mr. Paradise, I am going to give you back to the world. Give me back to the world. Yes, the stupid, blind, negligent world that let you slip away. Suppose I don't want to go back. Suppose I prefer to remain in oblivion, young lady. You can't. I won't let you. It's useless for you to resist. Don't try, Mr. Paradise. Don't try. I've already set the ball in motion. Then stop it quickly. Please. No. I've written letters to influential people, writers and publishers that I know in the East. I've already created a great deal of interest in you. When I leave here, you're going to leave with me. No. <laughs> yes, you are. You're going to live among people who appreciate genius. You're going to give readings and lectures. Readings? To whom? Clubs, colleges, societies of poets. 
lectures on what? Beauty, art, poetry. God forbid. <laughs> Haven't you been reading the papers lately? Why? Today, the world is interested in gunpowder. People cannot compete with the sound of bursting shells. These are the times for the discovery of new weapons of destruction, not for the resurrection of neglected poets. Even if I wish to be resurrected, Gabriel has not yet blown the horn. The surest and cruelest way to destroy Anthony Paradise, the poet, is to exhibit Jonathan Jones, the man, or what is left of the man. Don't you see that? What a grisly spectacle I would present on a college lecture platform. Look at me. You're not blind. What do you see? The way you look doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it does. Maybe not to you, because you're young and generous. No, no, the time isn't right. Keep the book. Remember my name and watch the obituary column. <laughs> Someday you will see the name of Jonathan Jones. Then come back again and look up Mr. Anthony Paradise. That will be his time when Jones is dead. Jones is a living contradiction of paradise. Paradise won't have a chance to breathe till Jones has stopped breathing. Take my word for that and be satisfied. Can't you be Anthony Paradise now? Again? No. No, it's too late. I'm too old. Death is the only thing that can possibly save my reputation. <laughs> Go back to school, little girl. There's an end to everything, even supplies of gunpowder. When they're exhausted, People will start looking again under broken table legs for little volumes of forgotten verse. By that time, Jonathan Jones will be safely out of the way. The sun will be shining in a clean blue sky. You will hear wind in the trees and rain on the roof and the songs of long lost poets. Guns explode and destroy and are destroyed. But this, these little songs, however little and unimportant, they have their times of eclipse, but they rise again. The motion of life is upwards. The motion of death is down. Only the blindest of all blind fools can fail to see which is going to be finally highest up. Not death, but life, my dear. Life. Life. I defy them to stop it forever. Not with all their guns. Not with all their destruction. We. We'll keep on singing. Someday the air all over the earth will be full of our singing. Is that your chauffeur? Yes. You'd better go. Mr. Paradise. Yes. Maybe you're right. I'm going to do what you say, keep the book, and remember your name. And watch the obituary column. Yes. And when the time comes, you can depend on me, Mr. Paradise. 
Thank you, my dear. I shall depend on you. I promise I won't fail you. Your future is safe in my hands. And now, Mr. Paradise, Won't you kiss me goodbye? No. Why not? No. For the same reason that I wouldn't touch a clean white tablecloth with mud all over my fingers. Oh. Bye, Mr. Paradise. This is from the notebook of Tregorin, uh, which was a very free adaptation of The Seagull by Tennessee Williams. Uh, I took part in a, a rather, well, actually a very interesting discussion at a cafe in Moscow that's popular with writers and other artists. Somebody said, there are some writers who can't create convincing female characters. And Boris, you're one of the few who can. I felt myself, felt myself flushing, <laughs> embarrassed. You see, um, I knew that he didn't like me very much. And he always disparaged my work. He went on to say that I had a certain softness about me in my eyes. And, well, <laughs> he was implying that I was deficient in virility for the practice of such a totally masculine profession as that of writing. I realized that and I stopped blushing. I looked him straight in the eyes, and I doubt that my eyes were soft then. I said to him, you are excessively delicate in your attack for a change. Now, why is that? What do you really mean? I doubt that I don't know, or anyone at this table doesn't know, so why hesitate to say it straight out like the shameless hack you are? He said nothing. I went on staring straight at him. Finally, he did speak. A single obscene word. Drank down his wine and spat it into my face. If I said to you that I think a writer needs a bit of both sexes in him. Well, no, no, you're, you're not a writer. <laughs> Writing, it's not an enviable obsession because it is just that, an obsession. You live from one work to another, the next, haunted always by, am I finished? <laughs> Will there be another? And you are someone in the hands of others who ask themselves the same question that you ask yourself, but, but in such a different way. You ask yourself the question because without a new work, 
to turn to, your life would be absent completely. They ask the question, because if you did not produce the new work, you'd no longer be of financial value or of any interest to them. A writer is a madman, probationally released. And yet, you know, when I'm writing, I, I do enjoy it, even reading the proofs. But when I see it in print, I'm devastated. It falls so short of the mark I've set for myself. And I'm so profoundly depressed. I have to run to, to Sicily or to Venice or some Greek island and, and turn for a while into a simply mindless beast. <laughs> you know, when I die, people that walk by my grave will say, here lies Trigorin. He was a good writer in his way, <laughs> but a far cry from Tolstoy and Turgenev and I would agree. This is a letter written by Tennessee Williams to Elia Kazan, April 19th, 1947, New Orleans, Louisiana. Dear Gadge, I am bitterly disappointed that you and Mrs. Selznick did not come to an agreement. I was wondering whether that was the primary trouble or if the script itself and your unwillingness to tie up with another producer. I am wondering what was the primary trouble, the script itself or your unwillingness to tie up with another producer? I'm sure that you must have had reservations about the script. I will try to clarify my intentions in this play. I think its best quality is its authenticity, its fidelity to life. I think its best quality is its authenticity, its fidelity to life. 
There are no good or bad people. Some are a little better or worse. But all are activated by misunderstanding than malice and blindness to what is going on in each other's hearts. I am sure that you must have had reservations about the script, and I will try to clarify my intentions in this play. I think its best quality is its authenticity and its fidelity to life. There are no good or bad people. Some are a little better or worse. And all are activated by misunderstanding than malice and a blindness to what is going on in each other's hearts. I am sure that you must have also had reservations about the script. I will try to clarify my intentions in this play. I think its best quality is its authenticity and its fidelity to life. There are no God, good or bad people. There are a little better or worse, all activated by misunderstanding than malice and blindness to what is going on in each other's hearts. I am sure you have reservations about the script, and I will try to clarify my intentions in this play. I think its best quality is its authenticity or its fidelity to life. There are no good or bad people. Some are a little Some are a little better or worse, but all are activated 
by misunderstanding than malice and blindness to what is going on in each other's hearts. <laughs> I am sure I am sure that this kind of direction it has to have. And I don't mean realism. Sometimes, sometimes a living quality is caught by expressionism and then what is supposed to be a realistic treatment. I remember you asked me, should the audience feel for Blanche? Well, certainly pissy. It is certainly pity. It is a an audience tra tragedy. Mm -hmm. tragedy that the classic aim producing catharsis of pity or terror and in it order to that Blanche must, must, finally have the understanding and compassion of the audience. This without creating a black-eyed villain of Stanley. It is a thing, a misunderstanding, not a person. Stanley that destroys her in the end. In the end, you should feel if only, if only they had known each other, about each other. But there was always the paper lantern or the naked bulb. Incidentally, at the close of the play, I think Stanley should remove the paper lantern from the bulb and Blanche should be carried out as he is the bulb after Blanche is carried out as he goes to resume the game. I have written all this out in case you were primarily troubled over my intention in the play. Please don't regard this as pressure. I have written all this out in case you were primarily troubled about my intention in the play. Please don't regard this as pressure. Just come down there. It works. A wire from Irene and a letter from Audrey indicate that both of them felt, feel you should. Have withdrawn yourself from association 
with us and that we feel we must find someone else. I don't want to accept this necessity without exploring the nature and the degree of the differences between us. Especially as now they are talking about someone I have never heard of, an Englishman named Tyrone Guthrie. <laughs> Sounds like a frightening kind of hybrid. <laughs> Don't please mention any of this to anybody but Molly. Sincerely, Tennessee. It worked out, of course. <laughs> Kazan went on to direct Treat Scar. <laughs> Marion, that was great, darling. That was great, sweet. Come now, we have to go on with the program. You did it. You did it. Let's, let's leave now, girl. Take your script. Take your script. And we'll go. Come on, guys. That was great. You were great. This is an excerpt from an early play called The Parade. Today seems funny to me. I'm conscious of my whole life stretching behind me. I feel the weight of every single day, a weight and a vagueness too, a tremendous vagueness. I think that I've been traveling through fog I'm looking back at everything. I remember single days, hours. None of them was ever complete in itself. They were all expectant. You know what I mean? They had their faces all turned one way toward the future, as though, as though a parade was coming, was going to pass. Well, I've stood here waiting so long that my neck's getting stiff from craning in one direction toward the distant calliope sound that doesn't get any closer. Is it imaginary? I see it all in my head. But I want to see the real thing, experience it in the flesh. I don't, I haven't, but I can describe it as if I did. The elephants are roped together with strings of pearls. The stately camels, they're ornamented too. Purple velvet trappings, brocaded, tasseled. The cleverly trained monkeys, they have on crimson silk jackets with golden bells. The bells clatter, then there's fanfare of trumpets. But it's all in my head. None of it's actually come by, and my neck's getting stiffer. Fat people are moving in front of me, blocking my view. I squeeze between, they complain, they shove. One of them stepped on my foot so hard, it'll ache for hours. I should just give it up. I suspect it was just a false report. 
a rumor without foundation, a beautiful myth. Or maybe the route was changed. The elephants may have revolted against their drivers, possibly trampling them, even as they turned in some intersection not expected. You see it? Slowly, ponderously, beautiful, massive grace. They've turned away from the route that was planned in advance, and the others have followed suit. They've all gone down a back street, just distant enough, so I can't even be sure I hear the music. You think the parade is love? What else is brilliant enough to make a parade? This is from Sweet Bird of Youth, and it's Chance Wayne and uh, the princess. <laughs> and uh, are you serious about this attempt to blackmail me? And Chance says, well, you better believe it. Your trades turned dirt on you, princess. You understand that language? The language of the gutter is understood by anybody who ever fell in it. <laughs> and Chant says, oh, then you do understand. And sh what if I shouldn't comply with your uh, order of yours? And Chant says, well, you still got a name. You're a personage. I mean, princess, you wouldn't want confidential or whisper or hush-hush or the narcotics department or the FBI to get hold of one of these tape records, would you? And I'm going to make lots of copies. Huh, princess? Chance, you are trembling and sweating. I mean, you see, this part doesn't suit you. I mean, you just don't play it well. Look, I hate to think of what kind of desperation made you try to intimidate me. Me, Alexandra DeLago. <laughs> With this ridiculous threat. It's so silly, it's touching. I mean, it's downright endearing. It makes me feel close to you, Chance. Look, you were well born. Weren't you born of a good Southern stock in a genteel tradition, given to, I mean, the one disadvantage, a laurel wreath on your forehead given far too early without enough effort to earn it? Where's your scrapbook, Chance? You know, the little, the little uh, book with all filled with theater notices and stills that show you in the background of, Come on here, start signing. Or what? Go take a shower under cold water. I don't like hot, sweaty bodies in this climate. <laughs> oh, you are, yes, I do want and will accept still under certain conditions, which I will make very clear to you. Oh, throw away that leaky pen of yours. When monster meets monster, one monster has to give way, and it will never be me. <laughs> oh. I'm older. I'm older than you, and, and much more naturally, I have a natural aptitude at it than you have. Now then, you put the cart a little in front of the horse. Sign checks are payment chance. Delivery comes first. Certainly, I could afford it. I could deduct you as my caretaker chance. Remember that I was a star before taxes. <laughs> and had a husband who was a great merchant prince. 
and taught me to deal with money. Now, Chance, please pay very close attention while I tell you the very special conditions under which I will keep you in my employment after this miscalculation. Forget the legend that I was and the ruin of that legend. Whether or not I do have a disease of the heart that places an early terminal date on my life, no mention of that ever, no reference, never, no mention of death, never, never a word of it. That odious subject. I have been accused of having a death wish. <laughs> but I think it's life that I wish for terribly, shamelessly, on any terms whatsoever. When I say now, the answer must not be later. I have only one way to forget these things I don't want to remember. And that's through the act of lovemaking. That's the only dependable distraction I have now because I need that distraction. It has to be now, not later. Chance, I need that distraction. It's time for me to find out whether you're able to give it to me. You mustn't hang on to this silly little idea that you can increase your value by turning away to the window when somebody wants you. I want you. I say now and I mean now. Then and not until then will I call downstairs to the hotel desk clerk, to the cashier and tell her I am sending a young man down with some traveler's checks to cash for me. Turning slowly from the window, Chan says, aren't you ashamed a little? More than a little. Aren't you? More than a little. Close the shutters and draw the curtains across. Now get a little sweet music on the radio. And come over here to me and make me almost believe that we are a pair of young lovers without any shame. From Person to Person, an essay. Of course it is a pity that so much of all creative work is so closely related to the one who does it. <laughs> I once saw a group of little girls on a Mississippi sidewalk all dolled up in their mothers and sisters' cast-off finery, old raggedy ball gowns and plumed hats and high-heeled slippers, enacting a meeting of ladies in a parlor with a perfect mimicry of polite southern gush and simper. But one child was not satisfied with the attention paid her enraptured performance by the others. They were too involved in their own performances to suit her. So she stretched out her skinny arms, threw back her skinny neck, and shrieked to the deaf heavens and her equally oblivious playmates, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> Look at me. And then a mother's high-heeled slippers threw her off balance. And she fell to the sidewalk in a great howling tangle of soiled white satin and torn pink net, and still nobody looked at her. I wonder if she is not now a Southern writer. <laughs> uh, 
Of course, it is not only Southern writers of lyrical bent who engage in such histrionics and shout, look at me. Perhaps it is a parable of all artists, and not always do we topple over and land in a tangle of trappings that don't fit us. However, it is well to be aware of the peril. <laughs> and not to content yourself with the demand for attention, to know that out of your personal lyricism, your sidewalk histrionics, something has to be created that will not only attract observers, but participants in the performance. I try very hard to do that. The fact that I want to observe what I do for your possible pleasure and to give you knowledge of things that I feel I may know better than you because my world is different from yours, as different as every man's world is from the world of others, is not enough excuse for a personal lyricism that has not yet mastered its necessary trick of rising above the singular to the plural concern, from personal to general import. But for years and years now, which may have passed like a dream because of this obsession, I have been trying to learn how to perform this trick and make it truthful. And sometimes I feel that I am able to do it. Sometimes when the enraptured street corner performer in me cries out, look at me, I feel that my hazardous footwear and fantastic regalia may not quite throw me off balance. <laughs> then suddenly you, fellow performers in the sidewalk show, may turn and give me your attention and allow me to hold it, at least for the interval between 8.40 and 11-something p.m. Eleven years ago, this month of March, when I was far closer than I knew, only nine months away from that long-delayed but always expected something that I lived for, the time when I would first catch and hold an audience's attention, I wrote my first preface to a long play, The Glass Menagerie. The final paragraph went like this. There is too much to say and not enough time to say it nor is their power enough. I am not a good writer. Sometimes I am a very bad writer indeed. There is hardly a successful writer in the field who cannot write circles around me. But I think of writing as something more organic than words, something closer to being and action. I want to work more and more with a more plastic theater than the one I have worked with before. I have never doubted that there are people, millions, to say things to. We come to each other gradually, but with love. It is the short reach of my arms that hinders not the length and multiplicity of theirs. With love and with honesty, the embrace is inevitable. This characteristically emotional, if not rhetorical, statement of mine at the time seems to suggest that I thought of myself as having a highly personal, even intimate relationship with people who go to see plays. <laughs> I did, <laughs> and still do. A morbid shyness once prevented me from having much direct communication with people, and possibly that is why I began to write to them plays and stories. But even now, when that tongue-locking, face-flushing, silent and crouching timidity has worn off with the passage of the troublesome youth that it sprang from, I still find it somehow easier to level with crowds of strangers in the hushed twilight of orchestra and balcony sections of theaters than with individuals across the table from me. Their being strangers somehow makes them more familiar and more approachable, easier to talk to.
the selection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This, uh, this selection is from The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Her Anymore. The character is uh, Flora Goforth. Uh, she's writing her memoirs this summer. She's on, on the Amalfi Drive in a very expensive villa. She's got the whole place wired for sound, so she can dictate in any part of the estate at any time in any of the three villas. And at the uh, this, this show opens with uh, her dictating. <clears throat> I made my greatest mistake when I put a fast car in his hands. <laughs> that red demon sports car, that his Pano Suiza, the Cadillac of Europe, his fighting cock, I called it, which he drove insanely, recklessly, between my estate and the casino at Monte Carlo so recklessly that the police commission of Monaco came personally to ask me, correction, implore me, well, to insist that he drive with me in the rolls with the chauffeur at the wheel for the protection of his life and the life of others. Well, <laughs> Monsieur le Commissionaire said, for me, there are no others. <laughs> but Madam, he said, for the others, there are others. <laughs> I then confessed to the police commissioner that over this young poet with Romanoff blood in his veins, I had no more control than my hands had over the, the sea winds or the, or the storms of the sea. The night, oh, he had flying dreams. He'd thrash his arms around like wings. And once his hand on which he wore a signet ring with a heavy Romanoff crest, struck me in the mouth and drew blood. Mm. After that, necessarily twin beds. <laughs> <laughs> Having had three wealthy husbands who were ugly as apes, <laughs> well, two ugly as apes, one looked like an ostrich, <laughs> I was delighted to discover that my fourth husband had only two things to recommend him. One, youth, two, great beauty. No, correction, change two things to three things. So, Alex had the heart of a poet, probably not the great talent, but the heart of the poet. And, and the heart shell of my heart the calcium deposits growing round it could still be cracked, broken through. And Alex broke through them and, 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 and brought me back to life and almost brought me back to youth. I gave the dear boy on his 25th birthday a Hispano Suiza, custom made, all of his favorite colors, an open car, what they used to call touring cars in those days. Well, I didn't realize I was giving him his hearse. He drove it off the Cornish between Monte Carlo and the Italian border. It rolled over five times, witnesses said, and he was pinned under the chassis and his lovely, lovely young head, it broke like, like the song, the shell of the songbird. He hung between life and death for six weeks in a clinic at Nice, I slept by his bed on a cot, never letting his hand leave mine for more than a minute or two. And he, he, he had 
one conscious moment, and in that one conscious moment, he whispered my name very clearly. Flora. Then he sighed like a sleepy child and fell asleep forever. This is a poem called Life Story. After you've been to bed together for the first time, without the advantage or disadvantage of prior acquaintance, <laughs> the other party very often says to you, tell me about yourself. I want to know all about you. What's your story? And you think, well, maybe they really and truly do sincerely want to know your life story. And <laughs> I saw you light up a, a cigarette and begin to tell it to them, the two of you, lying together in completely relaxed positions, like a pair of rag dolls a bored child dropped on a bed. You tell them your story, or as much of your story as time and prudence will allow, <laughs> and they say, oh, 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 <laughs> oh, oh, each time a little more faintly until the O oh is just an audible breath. And, and then, of course, there's some interruption. You know, slow room service comes up with a bowl of melting ice cubes, or, or one of you rises to pee and gaze at himself with mild astonishment in the bathroom mirror. <laughs> and then, the first thing you know, before you've had time to pick up where you left off with your enthralling life story, they're telling you their life story, <laughs> exactly as they'd intended to, all along. <laughs> and you're saying, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 each time a little more faintly, the vowel at last becoming no more than an audible sigh as the elevator halfway down the corridor and a turn to the left draws one last long deep breath of exhaustion and stops breathing forever. Then, well, one of you falls asleep and the other one does, likewise with a lighted cigarette in his mouth. And that's how people burn to death in hotel rooms. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky I get to read uh, the last two pages of one of the most beautiful plays ever written. Uh, and these last two pages are two of the most beautiful uh, pages written, maybe, well, at least two of the most beautiful pages written by an American playwright. Uh, since I'm from the South, I feel like I should do it in a Southern accent, but um, 
it's been a long time since I lived in Louisiana, and uh, my southern accent is sounding more and more like uh, Cletus, the slack-jawed yokel in The Simpsons. So, uh, Simpsons, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to... Anyway, it's the last two pages of The Glass Menagerie. Um, Amanda, uh, this is that right after the gentleman caller has revealed that he's already engaged and has left. And Amanda turns to Tom and says, where are you going? And Tom says, I'm going to the movies. And Amanda says, that's right. Now that you've had us make such fools of ourselves, the effort, the preparations, all the expense, the new floor lamp, the rug, the clothes for Laura, all for what? To entertain some other girl's fiance. Go to the movies, go. Don't think about us, a mother deserted, an unmarried sister who's crippled and has no job. Don't let anything interfere with your selfish pleasure. Just go, go, go to the movies. Tom says, all right, I will. The more you shout about my selfishness to me, the quicker I'll go, and I won't go to the movies. Amanda says, go then, go to the moon, you selfish dreamer. Tom smashes his glass on the floor. He plunges out on the fire escape, slamming the door. Laura screams in fright. The dance hall music becomes louder. Tom stands on the fire escape, gripping the rail. The moon breaks through the storm clouds, illuminating his face, a legend on screen, and so goodbye. Tom's closing speech is timed with what is happening inside the house. We see as though through soundproof glass that Amanda appears to be making a comforting speech to Laura, who is huddled upon the sofa. Now that we cannot hear the mother's speech, her silliness is gone, and she has dignity and tragic beauty. Laura's hair hides her face until at the end of the speech, she lifts her head to smile at her mother. Amanda's gestures are slow and graceful, almost dance-like, as she comforts her daughter. At the end of her speech, she glances a moment at the father's picture, then withdraws through the portieres. At the close of Tom's speech, Laura blows out the candles, ending the play. Tom says, I didn't go to the moon. I went much further, for time is the longest distance between two places. Not long after that, I was fired for writing a poem on the lid of a shoebox. I left St. Louis. I descended the steps of this fire escape for a last time and followed from then on in my father's footsteps, attempting to find in motion what was lost in space. I traveled around a great deal. The city swept about me like dead leaves, leaves that were brightly colored but torn away from the branches. I would have stopped, but I was pursued by something. It always came upon me unawares, taking me altogether by surprise. Perhaps it was a familiar bit of music. Perhaps it was only a piece of transparent glass. Perhaps I am walking along a street at night in some strange city before I have found companions. I pass the lighted window of a shop where perfume is sold. The window is filled with pieces of colored glass, tiny transparent bottles in delicate colors like bits of a shattered rainbow. Then all at once, my sister touches my shoulder. I turn around and look into her eyes. Oh, Laura, Laura, I tried to leave you behind me, but I am more faithful than I intended to be. I reach for a cigarette. I cross the street. I run into the movies or a bar. I buy a drink. I speak to the nearest stranger, anything that can blow your candles out. Laura bends over the candles. And Tom says, for nowadays, the world is lit by lightning. Blow out your candles, Laura. And so, goodbye. She blows the candles out. read um, scene six from Night of the Iguana. Would you mind repeating the question? Have you ever had in all your life and your travels any experience, any encounter with what Larry the Crackpot Shannon thinks of 
as a love life. <laughs> there are worse things than chastity, Mr. Shannon. Yeah. <laughs> Lunacy and death are both a little worse, <laughs> maybe. But chastity isn't a thing that a beautiful woman or an attractive man falls into, like a booby trap or an overgrown gopher hole, is it? I still think you are welching on the bargain. Oh, and Mr. Shannon, this night is just as hard for me to get through as it is for you to get through. But it is you that are welching on the bargain. You're not staying in the hammock. Lie down back in the hammock now. Yes. Yes. I have had two experiences. Well, encounters with... Two? Did you say? Yes. I said two. And I wasn't exaggerating. And don't you say fantastic before I've told you both <laughs> stories. When I was 16, your favorite age, Mr. Shannon, <laughs> each Saturday afternoon, my grandfather Nonu would give me 30 cents, my allowance, my pay for my secretarial and housekeeping duties, 25 cents for admission to the Saturday matinee at the Nantucket Movie Theater, and five cents extra for a bag of popcorn. Mr. Shannon, I'd sit at the almost empty back of the movie theater so that the popcorn munching wouldn't disturb the other movie patrons. Well, one afternoon, a young man sat down beside me and pushed his knee against mine, and I moved over two seats. But he moved over beside me and continued this pressure. I jumped up and screamed, Mr. Shannon. He was arrested for molesting a minor. Is he still in the Nantucket jail? <laughs> no, no, I got him out. I told the police that it was a Clara Bow picture. It was a Clara Bow picture. And I was just overexcited. Fantastic. Yes, <laughs> very. The second experience is much more recent, only two years ago, when Nano and I were operating at the Raffles Hotel in Singapore and doing very well there, making expenses and more. One evening in the palm court of the Raffles, we met this middle-aged, sort of nondescript Australian salesman. You know, plump, bald, spotted, with a bad attempt at speaking with an upper-class accent and terribly over-friendly. He was alone and looked lonely. Grandfather sent him a poem, and I did a quick character sketch that was shamelessly flattering of him. He paid me more than my usual asking price and gave my grandfather five Malayan dollars, yes. And he even purchased one of my own watercolors. Then it was Nano's bedtime, and the Aussie salesman asked me out in a sampan with him. Well, he'd been so generous, I accepted. I did. I accepted. Grandfather went up to bed and I went out in the sampan with this ladies underwear salesman. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that he became more and more... What? Well, Agitated. As the afterglow of the sunset faded out on the water. <laughs> well, finally, 
Eventually, he leaned toward me. We were vis-a-vis -vis in the sandpan, and he looked intensely, passionately into my eyes. <laughs> and he said to me, Miss Jelks, will you do me a favor? Will you do something for me? What, said I? Well, said he, if I turn my back, if I look the other way, will you take off some piece of your clothes and let me hold it? Just hold it. Fantastic. And then he said, it will just take a few seconds. Just a few seconds for what, I asked him. <laughs> he didn't say for what, but... His satisfaction. Yes. What did you do? in a situation like that? I gratified his request. I did. And he kept his promise. He did keep his back turned until I said ready and threw him the part of my clothes. Well, what did he do with it? He didn't move except to seize the article he'd requested. I looked the other way while his satisfaction took place. Watch out for commercial travelers in the Far East. <laughs> Is that the moral, Miss Jelks, honey? Oh, no. The moral is oriental. Accept whatever situation you cannot improve. Mm. When it's inevitable, lie back and enjoy it. Is that it? He brought a watercolor. The incident was embarrassing, not violent. I left and returned unmolested. Oh, and the funniest part of all is that when we got back to the Raffles Hotel, he took the piece of apparel out of his pocket, like a bashful boy producing an apple for his school teacher, and tried to slip it into my hand in the elevator. I wouldn't accept it. I whispered, oh, please keep it, Mr. Willoughby. <laughs> He'd paid the asking price for my watercolor, and somehow the little experience had been rather touching. I mean, it was so lonely out there in the sandpan with violent streaks in the sky and this little middle-aged Australian making sounds like he was dying of asthma. <laughs> and the planet Venus coming serenely out of a fair weather cloud over the Strait of Malacca. And, and that experience you call that a, a, a... A love experience. Yes. Yes, I do call it one. That, that sad, dirty little episode, you call it... Sad. It certainly was for that odd little man. But why do you call it dirty? How did you feel when you went into your bedroom? Confused. A little confused, I suppose. I'd known about loneliness, but not that degree or depth of it. You mean it, it didn't disgust you? 
Nothing human disgusts me unless it's unkind or violent. And I told you how gentle he was, apologetic, shy, and really very, very, well, delicate about it. However, I do grant you it was rather on the fantastic level. You're... I'm what? Fantastic. Sit down. Why didn't you take off your coat and loosen your collar? I better leave it on. No, I want you to be comfortable. I'm ashamed of the way I perspire. My shirt is sticking to me. Perspiration is healthy. If people didn't perspire, they would die in five minutes. <laughs> oh, this is a nice coat. What kind of material is it? They call that stuff alpaca. Oh. Alpaca. It's a very lightweight alpaca. Oh, lightweight alpaca. I don't like to wear a wash coat even in summer because I sweat through it. Oh. <laughs> and it don't look neat on me. A man with a heavy build has got to be careful what he puts on him so he don't look too clumsy. Oh, you are not too heavy. You don't think I am? Well, you're not the delicate type. <laughs> you have massive bone structure <laughs> and a very imposing physique. Thank you. Last Christmas, I was given a membership to the Nolans Athletic Club. Oh, good. It was the finest present I ever was given. I work out there with the weights, and I swim, and I keep myself fit. When I started there, I was getting soft in the belly, but now my belly is hard. It is so hard now that a man can punch me in the belly and it don't hurt me. Punch me. Go on. <laughs> See. <laughs> Gracious. <laughs> Guess how much I weigh, Blanche. Oh, I'd say in the vicinity of 180. <laughs> Guess again. Not that much. Uh, I weigh 207 pounds and I'm six feet one and one half inches tall in my bare feet without shoes on. <laughs> and that is what I weigh stripped. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's awe inspiring. <laughs> my weight is not a very interesting subject to talk about. What's yours? My weight? Yes. Oh, oh, guess. Let me lift you. Samson, <laughs> go on, lift me. Well? You are as light as a feather. <laughs> you may release me now. Huh? I said unhand me, sir. <laughs> now, Mitch, just because Stanley and Stella aren't at home, that's no reason why you should be, shouldn't behave like a gentleman. Well, just give me a slap whenever I step out of bounds. No, that won't be necessary. You're a natural gentleman, one of the very few left in the world. I don't want you to think that I'm severe and old school maidish or anything. It's just that, well. Huh? Well, I guess it is just that I have old fashioned ideals. Uh, where's uh, Stanley and Stella tonight? Oh, they've gone out. 
with Mr. and Mrs. Hubble upstairs. We should all go out together some night. No, that wouldn't be a good plan. Why not? Mm, you're an old friend of Stanley's? We was together in the 241st. I guess he talks to you frankly? Sure. Has he talked to you about me? I don't think he understands you. Well, that's putting it mildly. If it weren't for Stella about to have a baby, I wouldn't be able to endure things here. He's insufferably rude. Goes out of his way to offend me. In what way, Blanche? Well, in every conceivable way. I'm surprised to hear that. Oh, are you? Well, I don't see how, how anybody could be rude to you. Well, it's really a pretty frightful situation. You see, there's no privacy here. There's just these portiers between the two rooms at night, and he stalks through the rooms in his underwear at night. I have to ask him to close the bathroom door. Well, that sort of commonness isn't necessary. You probably wonder why I don't move out. Well, I will tell you frankly. A teacher's salary is barely sufficient for her living expenses. I didn't save a penny last year, and so I had to come here for the summer. And so I have to put up with my sister's husband. And he has to put up with me, apparently so much against his wishes. Surely he must have told you how much he hates me. I don't think he hates you. Oh, he hates me. Oh, why would he insult me? Blanche? Yes, honey? Can I ask you a question? Yes? How old are you? Oh, uh, wh why do you want to know? I talked to my mother about you, and she said, how old is Blanche? And I wasn't able to tell her. You talked to your mother about me? Yes. Why? I, I told my mother how nice you were, and I liked you. Mm. Were you sincere about that? You know I was. Why did your mother want to know my age? Uh, a mother is sick. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it badly. She won't live long. Maybe just a few months. No. She worries because I'm not settled. Oh. She wants me to be settled down before she... Uh, you love her very much, don't you? Yes. Well, I think that you have a great capacity for devotion. You'll be lonely when she passes on, won't you? I understand the better. To be lonely? I loved someone too. And the person I loved, I lost. Dead? A man? Yes, he was a boy. He was a boy. Just a boy when I was a very young girl. When I was 16, I made the discovery, love, all at once, and much, much too completely. It was like you suddenly turned a blinding light on something that had always been half in shadow. And that's how it struck the world for me. But I was unlucky, deluded. There was something different about the boy, a nervousness, a softness and a tenderness which wasn't like a man's, although he wasn't the least bit effeminate looking. Still, that thing was there. He came to me for help. I didn't know that. I didn't find out anything until after a marriage when we'd run away and come back and all I knew is that I had failed him in some mysterious way and wasn't able to give him the help he needed but couldn't speak of. I didn't know anything except that I loved him unendurably. But without being able to help him or help myself. And then I found out in the worst of all possible ways by coming suddenly into a room that I thought was empty, which wasn't empty, but had two people in it. The boy I had married and an older man who had been his friend for years. Afterwards, we pretended that nothing had been discovered. Yes, the three of us drove out to Moon Lake Casino very drunk and laughing all the way. We danced the Vosso Viana. Suddenly in the middle of the dance, the boy I had married broke away from me and he ran out of the casino. 
A few moments later, a shot. I ran out, all did, all ran and gathered around the terrible thing at the end of the lake. I couldn't get near for the crowding. Then someone caught my arm. Don't go any closer. Come back. You don't want to see. Oh, see? See what? Then I heard the voices say, Alan, Alan, the gray boy. He'd stuck the revolver in his mouth and fired, so the back of his head had been blown away. It was because, on the dance floor, unable to stop myself, I suddenly said, I saw. I know. You disgust me. And then the searchlight, which had been turned on the world, was turned off again. And never for one moment since has there ever been any light that's stronger than this kitchen candle. You need somebody. And I need somebody too. Could it be you and me, Blanche? This is a selection from Tennessee Williams' memoirs. Do you think that I have told you my life story? <coughs> I have told you the events of my life and described as best I could, without legal repercussions, <laughs> the dramatis personae of it. But life is made up of moment-to-moment -moment occurrences in the nerves and the perceptions, and try as you may, you can't commit them to the actualities of your own history. The work of a fine painter committed only to vision, abstract and elusive as he pleases, is better able to create for you his moments of intensely perceptive being. Jackson Pollock could paint ecstasy as it could not be written. Van Gogh could capture for you moments of beauty indescribable as a descent into madness. And those who painted and sculpted the sensuous and the sensual of naked life in its moments of glory made them palatable to you as we can never feel with our fingertips and the erogenous parts of our flesh. A poet such as young Rimbaud is the only writer of whom I can think at this moment who could escape from words into the sensations of being through his youth, turbulent with revolution, articulated by nights of absinthe. And of course, <clears throat> there is heart crepe. Both of these poets touched fire that burned them alive, and perhaps it is only through self-emulation of such a nature that we living beings can offer to you the entire truth of ourselves within the reasonable boundaries of a book. If that's the case, well, the inadequacies of this attempt to tell my life story, and believe me, I've tried to tell it, may be, surely must be, to my advantage. And I trust no serious disappointment to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.